We are here with one, so many people around the world. And I am very, very honored to be here with Lynn Twist and Janine Benias. And I'll speak more about them in just a moment. In the meantime, this is me, Maisa, joining from San Francisco. I'm here with Tracy Apple, who's also co-hosting with me, um, and our wonderful Josh Wolf, who's going to be helping us with all the tech. We're going to be together for about for 60 minutes, maybe just a little less than 60 minutes today. And you know, before we officially start, I wanted just to share what this space is. It's it's called Resilience and Possibility in these times, and it was first born as a response to the pandemic. And then it's been morphing as, as we hear from you, from the Pachamama Alliance global community. And as you tell us, what is it that you're hungry for? And, and so we respond to that. And I feel really confident that today I can say that we are here because we are as a community hungry to connect with one another, but in really connect with our sense of interrelatedness. I have a sense that we're gonna live really connected in, in more depth around that by the end of this call. Today, Lynn Twist is going to be guiding this space. Lynn, um, which I believe everyone knows, is our amazing Pachamama Alliance co-founder. She's also the founder of the Soul of Money Institute. And, uh, beloved colleague and friend. Um, I, I can say so much more about Lynn and I think she's just gonna show you who she is in this conversation with Janine. I will also let um, Lynn in a moment introduce Janine. As a disclaimer, I do wanna say that as a way of preparing for this call, we had a conversation with Janine last week and Lynn, Tracy and I were just in awe. It was just, so incredibly inspiring to be with Janine. And so we decided that today is a really good time to have Lynn and Janine be in conversation and for us to really witness what, what that is and what comes up. And because the connection with the work of Pachamama Alliance and what Janine and Biomimicry have to share is just so deep. It's like we've been friends forever and maybe we're just starting to find out that we were and we are. And so we may or may not have a lot of time for questions, um, but we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, we're gonna have chats open in, in a moment and then we're gonna close the chat and then we're gonna open them again toward the end of the call. But before I keep going, I, I love to invite Lynn to acknowledge sacred space. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Maisa, and hi, everybody. So great to be in the in the world of the, my Zoom screen with all of you. I've been scrolling back and forth and looking at everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this is such an exciting moment to interview uh, Janine that I can hardly stand it, but I will find a way to do sacred space. So as we always do with Pachamama Alliance, let's open sacred space. If you feel comfortable, please close your eyes. If you're driving, please do not close your eyes <laughs> and drop into the sweet territory of the breath. And as we breathe together, exchanging molecules from all that was, all that is, and all that will be, we remember, reconnect, re-deeply experience our interconnected nature, being, souls, molecules, biology, lives. I'm going to read a poem from Mary Oliver called Sleeping in the Forest. And if you keep, keep your eyes closed and just listen to my voice. I thought the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly, arranging her dark skirts, her pockets full of lichens and seeds. I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed, nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts and they floated light as moths among the branches of the perfect trees above. All night, I heard the small kingdoms breathing around me, the insects, the birds who do their work in the darkness. 
All night I rose and fell, as if in water, grappling with a luminous doom. By morning, I had vanished at least a dozen times into something better. We'll just be silent for about five breaths together. And open your eyes. Thank you, Maisa. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And as a way to continue to deepen that, that connection with the natural world and with, oursel with ourselves, I'd love to invite everyone to write in chat if it's possible for you. Uh, oops. Ooh. What is one thing that you have learned from nature? Or what is one thing, you can look at it as what is one thing that you appreciate or that stuns you about nature? I'm going to put that in the chat. And when you're ready, you can just begin to share. And let's see what, what this beautiful group has to share about that. Thank you. It could be pretty brief. You don't have to say everything you love about nature, but just one thing that makes brings nature very present for you by way of appreciation. Oh, renewal. He gives life magical. I found God. I met God. Yeah. Hmm. I can't control it. <laughs> Calming. True connection. Waiting gently. I meet myself. Grounding. Beauty. Aliveness. I know I am loved. Oh. Humility. Mm -hmm. Diversity. No waste. Seems like as many different people as there are on the call are as many different relationships we have to nature. Hmm. Disturbance, be here now. Belonging. Support others like trees do. Humility. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for putting your voice and your words in the space. And now I'd love to turn it over to, to Lynn. Okay, so um, I get to introduce Janine Benius. And I just want to say she's so super cool. That's the first thing that you need to know about her. And super fun and amazing. And she has a million credentials, so I'll get into that a little bit. But mostly, she's just a super cool player and a beautiful, beautiful soul. She's a biologist, a consultant, an author, a speaker. And she has introduced millions and millions of people, among which are many of us, to the concept of biomimicry through two incredible TED Talks that have listened, that have been listened to by zillions, six books, including the seminal book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And it's actually now a whole field. It's in universities, it's in education curriculum. It is, it is now in the culture, um, this idea of biomimicry, but really it got brought into being, into our consciousness through uh, Janine. She's the co-founder of the Biomimicry Institute, which is a nonprofit dedicated to making biology a natural part of the design process. And she has many roles. She serves on the board of the US Green Building Council, Board of Directors, the Advisory Board for the Ray C. Anderson Foundation and the Board of Directors for Project Drawdown. And um, if you know the story of Ray Anderson and Interface Carpet and the transformation that took place in that company. And if you don't know, just look up Ray Anderson. There's many films about Interface Carpet. What really catalyzed that whole incredible transformation of that company, the largest carpet company on earth, and the, really the seminal example of a CEO really transforming his worldview in a way that transformed an entire company and an entire industry. Um, you will learn a lot about Janine and the impact she's had in the world. 
So um, as Maisa said, we were so excited during our prep chat call. We, we could hardly let her go. Our prep calls are usually kind of short, but this was a really long one and we almost didn't let her let her off. Um, so I want to start by just um, inviting her to, uh, first of all, say hi. So say hi, Janine, and then I got to ask you the first question. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and hi, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, biomimicry, I, I, there's no one in the world who can more accurately describe what it is, an inherently interdisciplinary way of encouraging the world to, to see ourselves not only as part of nature, but uh, the complexity of the natural world is the key to almost any challenge that we have. Uh, but that's my version. Um, Janine, would you talk about what biomimicry is and how this is changing the way we think, the way we see the world, the way we understand who we are? I'd love to. Oh, it's my good. life's work. Yeah, <laughs> it's my life's work. Um, biomimicry is this profound shift from, for so long we've been learning about nature, and this is learning from nature. And that profound shift changes your lens with which you see the world. It's biomimicry is a, it's a practice, it's an innovation practice in which you say, what is it that I'm trying to do in the world? It could be a design, it could be some service you're doing in the world. And then say to yourself, is there anything in the natural world that already does what I am trying to do? And so it starts with this quieting human cleverness and when you're looking for sustainable solutions, actually saying, I am not the first on this planet to try to make sustainable materials. I'm not the first on this planet to clean water. I'm not the first on this planet to harvest energy from the sun. And perhaps um, if I quiet human cleverness and I listen very deeply, um, and echo what I hear, what I what I'm learning from the natural world. Uh, I could live on this planet in a more sustainable way. Mm. So what's happening now is um, this way of designing and of inventing and of innovating is traveling farther than I ever could imagine. Um, so you've got now, as you said. People, in, people are starting to take this at university. Can you imagine being a biologist and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn what I can learn from the natural world, and then I'm going to go into the world, and when it, whatever I make, whatever I design, um, I'm going to start by looking at biological models and then try to emulate them. Um, there are people in industry. There are people in social innovation. Um, there's pretty much everything that we, that we create, I think other organisms have already, have already tried to do that on some level. And they do it in a very, the rest of nature has done it in a very different way. After 3.8 billion years, um, it's been proven that that way is actually um, how to live here over the long haul. Mm. Fantastic. And can you um, can you talk about how indigenous wisdom and indigenous people uh, have been already engaged in biomimicry um, and how that because that's part of what we do at Pachamama Alliance. We're informed by actually founded by people say I'm the uh, founder, one of the founders of Pachamama Alliance. But um, my husband, Bill, who's one of the founders, says that Fa Pachamama Alliance founded us, not just found us, it founded us. It really uh, shaped us, shaped the way we see and think. And that comes from both indigenous people, but indigenous people's access, capacity to, um, to, to see and feel and be one with nature rather than study it or try to learn about it, as you said earlier. 
You know, I should always preface this, especially on this call, by saying that um, that biomimicry that's currently coming back and emerging back into our culture um, is has never been lost by many, many people around the world who have lived in and of their watersheds. Um, is remedial what we've been doing. It's remedial for Western industrial culture mm -hmm. because we forgot. I think of biomimicry as a remembering what we used to do when we lived close and, and paid it attention to the fine small details of our world because it was, our, it was how, we, how we thrived. You know, you needed to pay that kind of attention. Um, so I, we're, we're remembering, like we were dismembered and we're remembering in Western industrial culture. I think that indigenous people who have lived close and in a place for long, long periods of time practice biomimicry, they've been practicing it in deep time. Because I think that, you know, I think we, there was, you can imagine us as a human species and how awesome life was to us. You know, we couldn't fly. We couldn't, we couldn't sw swim in cold waters. We couldn't do the things that all these organisms did. We had huge respect, I think for organisms. And so we watched them. How do they, how do they walk on the snow, right? How does the snowshoe hare walk on the snow? Well, why don't we make something like that? So biomimicry is not new. It's new to us. It's mm -hmm. a remembering. Um, and I think, I think one of the, one of the things I'd like to learn most from indigenous communities, um, is the practice of deep observation, mm -hmm. that quieting human cleverness and seeing nature as the rest of the natural world <laughs> as teacher, as elder. Mm. That's what we have forgotten, that, that simple practice. Now, when you go into one of these giant companies, which I know you do, like you did Interface Carpet or any example you wanna use, and the capitalist mind and the profit, uh, you know, how can we get more people to consume whatever it is we're making? Is the name of the game, the frame of reference you're interacting with, how do you transform that? How do you, I mean, what happens? Can you give us a, a like a, a, a sample of, of how that works and what you've seen and what you've been able to accomplish? I know with many other people, but, but you personally. Yeah. You mentioned Ray, and this 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 scene flashed. Unfortunately, he, you know, he was in a toxic um, uh, industry of carpets, very toxic, and he died of liver cancer several years ago. But when I first met him, um, I went to he he called together the, this this group of this sort of eco conscience. He he was humble enough to do that to see if he was doing it right as he was taking this sustainability journey. You know, how, how might he do this? Because it was so foreign in industry back you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I went to my first meeting and I really felt like a fish out of water completely. I thought, what am I doing here with all this talk of tufting and carpets and backing and you know, big machinery? And what am I doing as a biologist? And he turned to me at that meeting and he said, um, how would nature make a carpet? And I said, probably out of CO2, out of carbon dioxide, you know, cause I thought of the major, what life does on the planet, you know, all the, all the plants that you see, everything green and everything that's hard in the ocean, like corals and reefs and shells, they're all made out of CO2. That's the carbon source, right? And I said, and we would probably pour it into a room. It would be liquid and then it would, self-assemble in the room and there would be no waste, there would be no factory, there would be no, right? And everybody in that room, I mean, it was, 
a tough room, you know, I mean, even in a, even in a sustainable company, they thought, what is this? And interestingly, and this is credit to credit to Ray during a break, we, we did this stair step thing where each, each day, you know, each day that we would go by and each stage that they were in, we would say, you know, they said they wanted to make something out of bio-based carpets and we'd say, okay, but it has to be non-GMO, but we would do a stair step. Okay. So this year, we're going to do it out of bio base next year. We're going to source it non GMO. Right. And, and that's how you do it. You like make your way up. And during the break, Ray walked over to that whiteboard and on the top of the stair step that we always had in front of us, he wrote carpets out of CO2 mm -hmm. as someday we'll get there. And they just announced their carbon negative carpet, which is sequestering CO2. Wow. Really? So that, you know, I mean, that what we wind up being when we walk as biologists at the design table, we walk in and we're the voice of the natural world of how nature, you know, does chemistry in water and at room temperature and with completely safe non-toxic materials. Um, we, we walk in with 3.8 billion years of experience. And it is, it is usually paradigmatically opposite of the way it is currently being done. But something happens because of this remembering. And people realize, especially now, I mean, 20 years ago, it, we, it was pretty wild eyed when we went in. I mean, people would look at us, you know, their arms crossed like this. The best thing you can do to convince people who are like this and skeptical is to have them actually try to take a problem and solve it by walking outside and learning something about how the natural world does it. Mm. It mm. is, it is, that's what's eye opening. Mm -hmm. And so that, again, I think that's how our work really intersects because there it's a, there's a relevatory nature to this. Mm -hmm. um, and when people realize, when they stand in front of a log, for instance, in the, in, outside, we take them outside and we talk about, you know, recycling carpet and, or recycling bottles or whatever. We, we look at a log that there's, you know, thousands of insects and fungi and bacteria that are taking those materials and upcycling them into their own bodies. And then the fung fungi is, you know, eaten by a mouse, which is upcycled into the mouse. And the mouse is eaten by an owl and it's upcycled into the owl. That's a very different way than taking a bottle and recycling it back into a bottle. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, so um, there's resistance at first, Lynn. Um, but then there's, I mean, you know, now 40% of interfaces uh, carpet tile, they make carpet tiles of their product line it come, came out of a biomimicry workshop. So they say, maybe it's important for us to have a new lens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so you do, it, you do it just through, I think we, we connect with people's deep love of the natural world mm -hmm. that they're not allowed to bring to work but for one day, they come out on a workshop with us. Mm -hmm. And then once that opens, that's all it is. It's just a shift of lens. And now all of their innovations start with what in the natural world does what I'm trying to do? How does nature cushion? How does nature make color? How would nature make this carpet chemically? How would nature decompose this carpet at the end of its life, right? And how would nature sell it? What kind of a marketplace would it, what kind of market ecosystem would it, would it put it into? And, and how many beneficial co-benefits would come out of the making and the sale and the decomposition of that carpet, right? Then they start thinking that way. Mm. So we're, it's a, it's a, oh, it's, it, and it's tough to walk into corporate America, you know? <laughs> It's, it's harsh, mm -hmm. it's harsh. And mm -hmm. so we just come in as, as true biologists. We don't try to be anything other than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and it opens people. It breaks people. It breaks hearts open, mm -hmm. even in those tough conditions. Did you have a, can you tell us about your childhood and, and how you ended up where you are? I mean, did you ever dream that you would be working with some of the biggest companies on earth and re having them rethink their entire capitalist model? Um, did you have a revelation? Did you have a deep spiritual life? Can you share a little bit about how you became Janine Benius? Um, no, I had no idea that I would be doing this. Lynn. I really, you know, like I shared with you, there, you know, before biomimicry, I was a natural history writer, and you know, I got nervous if there were more than two people in the room. I, mm -hmm. I just, but this work makes me bigger than mm -hmm. what I thought I was. Um, I grew up um, in suburban New Jersey. And um, I grew up in Cherry Hill when there were still cherry trees. And it didn't take long, you know, before suburbia sort of came and came over us. And my parents knew I had to be outside from the first thing when I wriggled out of my mom's arms after breakfast until a dinner uh, until the dinner bell i mean i was gone constantly so mm -hmm. they kept moving me out as the suburbs moved so that i would have just like a ravine in my backyard mm -hmm. you know and and i would go and i would find a meadow or you know a small orange stream this was new jersey you know <laughs> <laughs> and it was, but it was like a small wilderness, pocket wildernesses for me. And I just learned everything I could about the community that was there. You know, there was this one meadow and uh, I called it Sir Morton Romfield. <laughs> and I don't know why, I must have been reading British, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes or something. And I knew every family in that meadow. Like I, cause I spent all of my time there. I wouldn't even come back for lunch. I had a bag lunch, you know, and a little thing of milk. And I would just go around and I would check on cocoons and I would see how the rabbits are doing and where are the voles? And, you know, I knew them all. Mm. And, and that's where it started. I realized how competent that community was. Mm. Incredibly competent. And, and, and I said to myself, if, if other people knew what I knew, um, we would stay our hand. We would, we would practice restraint and we would practice being in good relations with these relatives of ours. That actually I saw them as, you know, more competent than what I saw going on in the world as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole, I, and then I started to write, then I started to write these natural history books to try to make people fall in love, basically, and, and not just in love, but to develop respect mm -hmm. and reverence, mm -hmm. because they were so cool. They, they were so, you know, as a system, um, so coherent, right? And so resilient and so transcending everything that came at them um, season after season after season. I just, I was, I was sitting at their feet. Mm. And then for me, I just assumed biomimicry was a thing. I didn't know how things were invented, how we made everything in our world, you know, how we created our management structures. I didn't know how we did any of that. I assumed that we, I assumed that when you made a solar cell, you went and you found a botanist and the botanist taught you how a leaf, how a leaf worked. Mm -hmm. I assumed that. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked to find out there wasn't a field. And, and so I started collecting for this book. Um, every time I found a scientific article where somebody was trying to make a so better solar cell by looking at a leaf and they were really faint little signals, you know, in the literature. Um, and finally, I just had enough, you know, I had a folder because it was, we were Xeroxing back in those days. And then I had a filing drawer and then I had a filing cabinet 
And I walked past it one day and I said, and this has a field that didn't have a name. Nature inspired innovation had no name. And I walked by the filing cabinet and I said, what, this needs a name, <laughs> need to name this field, right? Then we need to, this is some, this is happening already. So all I did was a pointing exercise really. And I just wrote this up in this book and I went back to write my next book and, and then the world came calling mm -hmm. and said, okay, we're ready to do this now. The biomimicry book and the naming of biomimicry has been such a seminal turning point for, you know, millions and millions of people and hundreds, probably thousands of companies. And it's, I think when we look back, if we make it through this wormhole at turning points in our consciousness and our way of seeing our place in the universe, your work and what you've done will be one of the things that is, you know, that's just like a, one of those revelatory turning points. Um, I, I want to also invite you to share with us. Um, we asked you when we were in, in our prep call about social justice, which is a huge issue now in the world since George Floyd, it, everything's on the table in a way that it probably should have been long ago, but it is now. Um, and you gave us some beautiful statements about nature and how it can teach us even about that, about BIPOC, about, about uh, people of color, about transgender, about, it was just amazing what you said. I wondered if you'd go into that again now for, for all of our, our Apache people who are listening. It was just wonderful to hear that. Nature, when I say nature, it's the rest of nature. I believe we are nature, of course. Mm -hmm. But nature, we, banks on diversity. Diversity is at the, at the very, very center of how life um, gets better generation after generation after generation and how life bounces, doesn't bounce back, it bounces forward. Diversity is always the number one thing that, that you need in an ecosystem in a population of, in a species, in a local population, you need a diversity, not only of um, different species, but within a species, all the robins that you see in your yard, if you've got lots of robins, every single one of those, even if they're very related, they're very different. Each of them is very different. That's why, you know, that, that kind of diversity of approaches, of, of genetic, genetic adaptations. They're just adaptations. Think of ideas, a diversity of ideas, but also a diversity of ways of living, right? So you and I were talking about during Pride at, at the Biomimicry Institute, we were putting out these blog posts about um, how, much, how many queer animals there are in the natural world. Um, I mean, queer behavior in the natural world, there's at least 500 species that are documented, right? Um, and interestingly enough, that um, we somehow didn't discover that until the 90s. It's because it was, we weren't allowed to really talk about that. That wasn't, it was kind of frowned on by your graduate committee. <laughs> but yeah, once we, once we realized, and why is that? Why these, these different ways of, of making a living or different ways of um, being in relationship, you know, organisms that are in, and they're, you know, they're bonded for life. There are many of them that are mated for life, same sex couples. They often wind up being the ones that sound the alarm for the other organisms that are there who are busy with kids. They often take care of the young, of, 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 their, of the, the ones in their groups. I mean, there's, there's all these other things that they do besides procreating. When they are left with eggs, they often make very, very, very good parents, it turns out. Like the black swans, a quarter of all black swans are male, male um, 
hair bonds. Oh, okay. And when they are, when they take on eggs, the, um, those eggs do better than eggs that don't have that coupling, that kind of a couple to take care of them, right? The males are, they're really good defenders. Do they, do um, they lay so the yeah. eggs? Well, wait, do they, where do the eggs come from? From them or from females? The eggs, come from, the eggs are laid by uh, females and they, sometimes the females will abandon it. Sometimes they will kind of get into a threesome and then the female will, the female will let the, the males take care of the eggs. Uh -huh. Wow. There's all kinds of, what I'm saying is there's all, in the natural world, there's all kinds of ways of, of being. And I'll tell you about my field out here because I'm looking at my pasture out here. In, I live in Western Montana. And when we first moved here, there were, it was 100% spotted knapweed, which is, a, which is a, 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 a plant that comes in. It's an invasive that comes in and it poisons uh, other plants around it. It comes in when something is very overgrazed and this land was really, really overgrazed. And we spent, my partner and I spent about 12 years broadcast seeding in a diversity of seeds, diversity of seeds. And we brought goats in because they love the knapweed. So eventually it did flip, but, the, but what happens out there is two kinds of diversity. There's a functional diversity out there. So there's, there's like, you know, some species are nitrogen fixers and some species are there in the spring, some species are in the fall, right? There's a functional diversity, but then there's also a response diversity. Those are the two kinds of diversity in the natural world. And the response diversity is that if it's a cold spring, some, some plants will come up that are in the seed bank because they're really good during cold springs. But then when there's a hot fall, other plants will come up because they're really good at that. So that's response diversity. Mm -hmm. So there's response diversity and functional diversity. In order to meet the challenges of a complex adaptive system that's always changing, you need every single one of those. Who is to say which plant should not be in there? Mm -hmm. And that's what we kept doing for 12 years. We would take different native seed mixes and just put more and more diversity. And I just watch every year they come up and what has happened that has healed. Yeah. That field has healed itself through the diversity. Mm. It is always covered and it's always taking sunlight, turning it into sugars, pushing it down into the soil, feeding the microbes, the diversity of microbes because of the diversity of plants, mm. right? We are not smart enough to guess who is needed on this planet, right? Because we don't know who is going to be the plant that is good during a cold spring, mm. right? Mm. That's life banks on diversity. Mm. Life banks on diversity, absolutely. So you talk often, and I've heard you speak about awe and reverence, and I can feel, you know, when you speak and you look at your meadow and just the way you are, that there's so much love in your life. I mean, it makes me it's very moving to me. What about God? What about God? What about spirit? What about what many people would relate to awe and reverence to, to spirit or to God? How does that figure in here for you? Oh, for me, you know, I'm an animus. I mean, I, I'm this creation. Um, I have a deep spiritual connection to it. Mm. Deep spiritual. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And it's my teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm in that. I think biomimicry, you know, you, you there's so many ways you can describe it. It's an innovation practice. But deep, deeply, this is what I hoped it would be, is changing our stance 
towards the rest of the natural world mm -hmm. to one of humility and deep respect and reverence. Mm -hmm. um, it, and that, because I think that's the most important emotion if we are to reintegrate ourselves, Western industrial culture, back into this incredible um, community, right? Mm -hmm. our, our first thing has to, has to be that sense of, of, um, of respect mm -hmm. for the genius that surrounds us, mm. right? And so, for me, I'm, yeah, it's, it is a, yeah, I'm surrounded by spiritual teachers mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by very practical teachers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the we, same we've... living well, you know, how shall we live? I think is the most important spiritual question. Mm -hmm. How shall we live here? We've um, we've done a lot of uh, studying with Thomas Berry, Father Thomas Berry, um, and and he talks about the, you know the the force that put the the stars in motion and that generated the the longing for life and what gave birth to this miraculous, incredible array of life is something that none none of us can ever understand, but we can bow to it. We can we can know it is at work in us, you know? And that's how I hear you and that's how I see you as a, like almost like an instrument of the, the deep and profound intelligence of the, of, of the natural world. I mean, we are, as you say, we're, we're, not, we're not, we don't live in the natural world, we are of it. Um, and, and that way of being, that way of seeing, um, I think is really in, in so many ways what your, your message always ultimately is. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that shows up for you and what you want for humanity? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, the thing that life does that is, that I'm most humbled by, that I'm most grateful for that I want to step into the shoes of, right? I want to. I want us as a young species to grow into, right? That's what I really hope for: is that we, that we we grow up. This young species, we grow up with our elders' help. What life does is life creates conditions conducive to life. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, and yet it's incredibly profound that's how life has gotten to stay here over the long haul and also how life has taken you know when i think of father barry and telling that cosmic story taking this ball of you know this rock and sea this very harsh earth you know um as an early earth and literally created life creating conditions conducive to life creating the cocktail of gases that life needs to live right creating soil cleaning and creating water and cycling that water right in everything life does it's constantly sweetening making of this place an Eden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what life does. And we, our true nature is that. I mean, when people say, well, what gives you hope? I'm like, well, I hope we, I hope Sleeping Beauty wakes up soon <laughs> because our true, nature, our true nature is to create conditions conducive to life. And we know how to do that. Many of us in Western industrial culture especially have forgotten. That's why biomimicry is a remembering. 
Mm -hmm. Life creates conditions conducive to life, right? And um, that's what I want humanity. That's the design brief that the designers have this term design brief, which is tell me in a short little bit what, how, what you want me to do with this design or with this house. What's the brief? The design brief is can we join the rest of the natural world in creating conditions conducive to life, capital L. Mm. And that means every single diverse, beautiful human soul on this planet. But I would say with all, I would say as although Leopold did, we need to expand our circle of kinship so mm. that we're creating conditions conducive to all life, mm. capital L, right? Mm. I mean, if I, if I may, I oh, sorry. What's that? Oh, sorry. I have one more question, Maisa. Can I? Did you want to? Did you want to open it up? Uh, no, I had one question too. But oh, please okay. go ahead. I just want to ask you, Janine, to address the pandemic as a biologist and its impact on our lives and its teaching. Um, how do you see that? The COVID nineteen episode that we pause. are still in. The great pause. We're still in it. We're still in it. Um, First, I would like to say that one of the things that I, it, it's a kind of a litmus test or whatever, I take the temperature and I look out into the scientific literature and I say, how many scientists, and there are some, but it's not a large number, are looking, are asking bats how to keep ourselves from overreacting to the COVID virus. Because when you hear, you know, and 76% of our, of, our, of our infectious diseases are zoonotic, meaning they come from animals. But what that means is that the bat has lived for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years with the COVID virus, lived with it. Mm. and with other coronaviruses. We need to be asking these organisms <laughs> how they do that. <laughs> so when you, when you say, yes, we, you know, when I, when I think about biomimicry and how far it's come in this, you know, uh, on this arc, this beautiful arc, I think not far enough <laughs> because that's you know, the first thing we should have all done. Like we should have raced to the bats rather than maligning them. Bats gave us COVID. No, bats are awesome mm. bats live beautifully with covid their mm. immune system does not overreact how mm. are you doing that bats could you teach us uh, there are some scientific yeah i know but but see i just say that because why are you you're you're going wow right because it didn't occur yeah it's amazing <laughs> Too obvious right. see, that, that's it so uh. that's, yeah, yeah, but I, I also am a big fan of rest. Um, and in the natural world, you know, everything sleeps, bacteria sleep, like rest. And there's so many names for it, diapause, estivation is hi hibernation during summer. Uh, torpor is, you know, the hummingbird just sort of really getting into a deep sleep, you know? Um, so many, life is cyclic and a lot of it has to do with resting before the next big push. Mm. And so those of us who are privileged enough to have been able to pause and not go under, but even those of us who had to work like crazy all the way through this, things have changed. Mm -hmm. It has really, really changed. It's kind of the release that I've been waiting for, where we, where the, we, we showed ourselves that business as usual can change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
mm. right? Mm. It can change. And I are you familiar with the adaptive cycle? Do you know about that? I don't know. Why don't you tell us? Okay, but then... so it's it comes from from ecology. It comes from a guy named C.S. Holling, a Canadian scientist. And it's an infinity sign. Imagine mm -hmm. an infinity sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what it describes is how ecosystems go from seedling all the way up to a mature forest. That's the for loop of the figure eight of the infinity sign. That's the front of it. It's growth, growth into maturity. And then a fire happens, pests come because it's time to release all of those nutrients. So then you go into the release phase, that's the back loop, and that's where we are. And the back loop of that infinity sign, that's when you reorganize. So the forest, for instance, burns down. All those nutrients are released and they can go back into whole new structures. They can, they can form new relationships, new, you know, they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of things that are remembered in the seed bank, but you can do things in a new way. That's where we are. So then the back loop is you, you it's a very fast loop in the natural world where you're re-knitting together that society and you're putting, putting new structures together and new kinds of relationships of organisms in that, in that forest. And then you come down and you start to grow again. But uh -huh. that back loop is where we are now. Mm. We've released, we had a little pause. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people aren't going back. They're gonna reinvent themselves. Think of all the reinvention you hear about right now. Mm -hmm. New ways of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. That's a classic back loop. And that back loop happens quickly. It's terribly under-resourced. You usually do not have a lot of resources during that time. It's a tentative, kind of a dangerous time in the sense that, you know, but it's so important to be careful right now about putting things back together mm. in, the, in new structures, new ways of being, new networks, new ways of working, new ways of thinking. And then you, you basically that you go up, you go up here and it's reorganization, you're reorganized, and then you come back around for the growth. So whatever we create now, that's what we're going to grow for the next long period of time. So I've been mm. waiting for a release. Wow. Good people, not just nutrients, people are free. Mm -hmm. Ideas are freer. Yeah, that's where we are, I think. Wow. Woo, I love that. Maisa, we have a couple minutes left. I'm sorry, do you want to ask another oh. question? May, may, let's see if, um, hopefully this is not too big of a question, Janine. Only, yes, we have a couple of minutes, but some of what, what we're doing right now as Pachamama Alliance is inviting people to really work in their communities to bring forth and to address climate justice. And I'm wondering if there are lessons from nature, from the organizers of nature that we can share with our organizers here as they engage in this important work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, would, I would invite people to study what we biologists call mutualisms because partnership, good partnership will lead to organization, you know, good, good organizing. But partnership, the way the natural world practices it because most of what we see out there, we've been told it's competition. That's a small part of it. A much bigger part of it is mutually beneficial relationships. Think the bee and the flower, they give each other something. The tree and the fungus, the fungus gives the tree, you know, phosphorus, the tree gives the fungus under the ground, you know, carbon. That's a relationship, it's a partnership. And we've been, biologists have started to study this. We're actually getting asked by companies now to come in when they're, mer when they're doing mergers or they wanna talk about the, we have these hallmarks of mutualism. And so study mutualisms, cause there's a whole, how they're 
how they're formed, how these relationships are formed. They're quite just. These if there there needs to be reciprocity, otherwise the partnerships do not form. First, first they're formed with a lot of trust. There's an etiquette. Uh, you know, even the tree and the fungus will sort of see whether or not they can trust one another. Mm. Right? There's a there's a they give <laughs> one gives something, the other gives something. And they sort of go back and forth and they say, okay, now we can trust each other. But then to maintain that trust is it literally is a is a justice kind of a thing because if one of the partners reneges on their partnership, there are sanctions. There literally are like other other fungi that are in that group. They're in these mutualistic guilds. They actually that's not okay. It's not allowed. What's really it's called cheating. And what's really interesting and what Darwin couldn't believe, Darwin, if you read Darwin's journals, you'll see that he, what really bothered him was, okay, I'm talking about all this natural selection and struggle for existence, but why is there so many mutualisms in the natural world? And if one, if one partner reneges or is a bad actor, why doesn't that, why doesn't that spread in the population? Because it would seem as if, and this is what we tell ourselves in Western industrial culture, the, you know, if, if you're able to get a, a hand up somehow, then you'll succeed, right? And Darwin even thought that. He said, why aren't there cheaters everywhere? And they're, they're, they come around, they come around, but there are sanctions and there's partner choice. You can choose a different partner and believe it or not in the natural world, scientists are now coming around to the idea that natural selection might choose organisms for their partnership capability and their how, how, um, how trustworthy they are in mm -hmm. a sense. Are they a good partner? And that's what wins. So the, uh, and I'm, I'm writing a new book and, and, and that's one of, the, one of the chapters is about community um, and it's a universal. So, I would say that, yeah, the, 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 the justice, the arc, it's, it's, it is bending Dr. King towards justice mm -hmm. because when we get into our true nature, we will understand the importance of building, maintaining and passing on partnerships. Mm. Oh my God, that was awesome. That's just beautiful. Thank you, Maisa, for that question. I, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, but um, thank you so much, Janine, for who you are, for what you do, for the work you have spawned, ignited, created, invented, and spread. And we are the grateful recipients of this hour with you. Um, and hopefully it is the beginning of a long and beautiful partnership, a mutually trusting partnership uh, that we can draw on forever and ever and ever. Thank you so much. And over to Maisa to just say a few words before we close. Thank you, thank you, for, thank you for sharing your community and, and trusting me enough to, um, and, and thank you for your questions, Lynn. You're a very good interviewer. You're very, <laughs> very good. Yeah, you, um, yeah, it's, it's um, thank you for letting me be at, at this deeper level mm. with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine. I have opened the chat for everyone if you want to share something that really is standing out for you and staying with you about today, you can share it on chat. I um, also I'm going to post in chat uh, just some of the resources that Janine has shared with us. So I'll put the websites there. And thank you everyone for joining us. We will be sending an email, a follow-up email with um, in the recordings. Um, some people asked me that, so it will be there. And we really hope you have a lovely day, week and month and all of the days ahead, which you will have to process, digest, be with and integrate everything that we've heard about today. Um, Aisa, what's the one website that, um 
if you could just leave people with that one website that Janine said was the number one place to send people. What's Ask nature that org. And it. there you are. You all have it. There's and a few. The, um, put the design lens in where there's there's something called life's principles that I'd like to share with everybody. Mm. Yeah, that they can download. Oh, right. life's principles, right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's on our site. Um, but and I sent I sent it to you, but you know if you can put it on your site too, um, it would be great. Um, there's like 26, 27 things that all organisms have in common. I will be sure to put it on the on the page where everyone can go and access the recording. They can access that and also the websites which I've also put on chat. Thank you, everyone. Again, it's lovely to see you. Lovely to be in your company. Have a wonderful day. You can now say your goodbyes. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye